kind of answer them in the same answer, or do the academic thing is not really answering, but I'll, I'll try. Um, in an ideal world, a deterrence based on conventional weapons or you know, less destructive weapons would be ideal. It, I mean, well, it wouldn't be ideal, but it would be better than where we are now. The problem, of course, is how do you get there? We are not, you know, we can't just shift. And it's this transition, I think, that's really important. This shift between what is already a complicated endeavor, you're now adding in more pressures. And I think there's an important difference here between, and this is it's a difficult argument, it's one I want to make between conventional deterrence and advanced conventional weapons. And that's why I think that these systems, missile, depending on how they use missile defense, precision, particularly regional, global, and cyber, are slightly different in, in, in the way they impact things. So I think that's a problem. And I think a good example of this, uh, so a lot of what I'm talking about is US driven at the moment. And I would argue that the US could probably meet a lot of its deterrence requirements without nuclear weapons. Now, I don't think the Pentagon would agree with me, but I think in, in theory it probably could with what it wants to do. It has more than enough everything else to do. However, the more and more the, the US relies on these types of weapons for deterrence, we've already seen missile defense become part of US thinking, precision strikers exactly because of North Korea and so-called others. Um, the more it drives everybody else to diversify and increase their nuclear weapons. So there is a problem in how you, in how you transfer this. Um, there's an interesting story behind this, but I'll perhaps leave some of that for, for, for coffee. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. First of all, I, I want to make just a, a few uh, responses to um, what Dr. Salik said, because first of all, to say, you know, when I used the word deployed, I misspoke. I understand he got something deployed. Uh, and I, I fully accept that Dr. Khan may, may, may have made statements that were exaggerated in relation to the Rust X crisis. Uh, I think the question of the cargo crisis is quite interesting, and it's interesting to compare the Indian and the Pakistani interpretations of that. But clearly, I think it is a fact that the Indian reaction was greater than what Musharraf ex expected at the site, and that pretty much all of the calculations that Musharraf made at the time did not bear out in, in, in the end. And there's another interesting question about the nuclear element because clearly there were some movements taking place which co may have convinced the Americans that there was a transport and re a readiness of nuclear weapons which didn't exist at the time. And so there may be a nuclear element to this or not, but it's, it's, it's a controversial issue, I understand. On the question of uh, Star Wars, I think it's important to understand that at the beginning, when start, the SDI initiative was announced by Ronald Reagan, the Soviet Union saw this as a ma major escalation in the Cold War. But later on, it took a much more um, uh, measured view of this, and it became quite clear that the Soviet Union could fairly cheaply uh, develop countermeasures to SDI. So SDI, in the end, in the Cold War, did not have quite the significance that some historians might assign it to, um, and the, when you look at deterrence, obviously the question is, can, deter, can deterrence be stable if one side can uh, eliminate or compromise the capability of the other side? This is the paradox of nuclear deterrence. Nuclear deterrence, uh, neutral deterrence only works if both sides have a secure capability. And so it is in principle possible that BMD in South Asia might compromise that, but as we have before, we are a long, long way away from that. Um, in terms of going to sea, again, in one, on one level, if Pakistan could develop, like India is trying to do, a secure second strike, strike capability from sea, there is a possibility that that, that might enhance uh, deterrence. But on the other hand, if it uses noisy submarines that can be easily detected and so forth, it might also destabilize the situation. So this is a comp very complex issue. Um, about the question of non-state actors, first of all, non-state actors cannot be deterred by nuclear weapons. I think we have to be absolutely clear about this. I mean, I'm, when I use the, the, the instability, instability paradox, I don't think that it, I'm trying to make the point, it doesn't really uh, apply to India and Pakistan as the way, in the way it has been applied in the literature, because the situation doesn't really correspond that in, in the way it, it was developed. And what I see really is we, the way in which we should look at this situation is more as a persistent conflict uh, in which, uh, which is suppressed to a large extent because of the, the presence of nuclear weapons. 
But nevertheless, efforts are made on both sides to progress this conflict in some way and in a, in a more limited way that gives rise to these elements of instabilities. But however, it is possible that non-state actors might change the strategic equation, especially if non-state actors threaten the internal stability of Pakistan, and that would have very profound uh, consequence, I think, for the security of South Asia. Uh, about uh, Judy Kasmi's question on stability and stability paradox and uh, security trilemma. First of all, I think the uh, example which people generally cite is that Pakistan in the first place initiated the Kargil conflict uh, after the nuclearization thinking that with the nuclear cover they will be able to uh, carry out this and that's how it fits into stability and stability. I can tell you with my very personal experience of being close to the uh, things uh, as they were happening, I can assure you that the planners of Kargil had no clue as to how the nuclearization has changed the security environment. And that is how they blundered into this. They only realized that they have committed a mistake but there was very adverse international reaction, which they were not ex ex expecting. The second thing which happened was that, as uh, Professor has said, that Indians reacted very strongly. It was not because of uh, any other uh, reason, but the fact that right at the time once the Kargil was going on, the Indian government lost a vote of confidence in the parliament and they were facing a fresh election. They had to act strongly, otherwise they would have lost elections. And that was their domestic political compulsion to uh, act strongly, but still, as I said, they remain the conflict uh, confined to a narrow sector. As far as uh, the movement of forces, uh, the, the Rydell article, uh, Bruce Rydell's article, uh, famous article, I, I am witness again to the conversation between a visiting American scholar and the DGSPD at that time. Uh, once he was, he, he asked his comments on Rydell's article that there was there some movement detected of. Uh, some uh, nuclear system being moved around. Uh, and he said, how would you like to comment on this? He said, I will just say one word, and that is rubbish. And that is exactly the situation because there was no uh, movement of missiles or weapons or anything. So I think uh, uh, much is made out of it. Responsible people on both sides. General Musharraf, who was uh, the army chief here, and General VP Malik, who was uh, the army chief in India, both have categorically denied any nuclear angle to the Kargil conflict or any kind of movement. It is only Raj and Gapa's book in India where he's talked about uh, some nuclear movement and uh, the Bruce Ryder's article which talks about it and we know uh, that story how uh, that, that was built up to, uh, uh, I think, uh, confuse Nawaz Sharif and press, uh, pressurizing him, him into agreeing uh, to the draft which was being offered to him. About the security trilemma, yes, that's a complicating factor in South Asia because and this, this trilemma has different dilemmas within it. There is a security dilemma between India and Pakistan. There is a security dilemma between China and India. And then there is another branch of this trilemma which is between the Chinese and the Americans. So one side doing anything uh, impacts on the policies of the, uh, the second part of that dilemma and that in turn affects uh, the other states in, in that chain. So anything Americans do, the Chinese uh, react to that and whatever Chinese do, the Indians react to that and that impacts on Pakistan and Pakistan has to respond. And that, that complicates the situation which is uh, uh, not, it does not have any precedence in, from the old uh, uh, war days. So that, that, that's a difficulty here we have. Thank you. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have we have very limited time, so um, let me tell you that some of the people who want to ask questions, they will probably have to uh, engage uh, during the tea. Um, I will um, do this sequencing of three young people, and then you. So we will we will do it this way. 
Uh, let's begin with the two ladies sitting out right there.